systems in the Pacific Northwest and Northern Rocky Mountains. On this topographic map, um, I have high ele higher elevations in purple and lower elevations in green. And the Snake River currently makes its path from the location of the Yellowstone National Park um, in Wyoming and through the Snake River Plain, which is this nice topographic depression that looks kind of like a smiley face in Idaho. And it currently connects through to the Columbia Basin System and eventually to the Columbia River itself through something called Hell's Canyon. Hell's Canyon is actually the deepest canyon in North America. It's just a little bit deeper than, um, than the Grand Canyon in Arizona. But as early as 1898, geoscientists noticed and published um, some unusual characteristics about the Snake River, specifically near Hell's Canyon. So I'm gonna zoom in to the topographic um, uh, map in the Hell's Canyon region, highlighted in this red box here. So the river network here is shown as these blue lines in the topography data set. I've highlighted specifically where the Hell's Canyon is as this thicker line going from south to north. The, the river flows um, in that direction currently. However, what geoscientists noticed early on was that there are these unusual features called barbed tributaries on the south side of Hell's Canyon. Barbed tributaries have been identified in lots of different places in the world as um, uh, geomorphic indicators that a river may have flowed in the opposite direction to where it currently flows. So there's a couple creeks and tributaries that I've highlighted. There's Pine Creek, Indian Creek, and Wild Horse Creek. And based on their orientation, it looks like the Hell's Canyon or the Snake River should be flowing south in this very specific region. And let me highlight that for folks on Zoom here. So in this region, it looks like the Hell's Canyon should be flowing to the south. Oh gosh, now I zoomed in. I don't know how to undo that. Um, minus, control minus. Okay, great, thanks. A couple things in the way. So another feature, uh, some other geologic features that folks noticed early on is that there's a very thick sequence of sedimentary, um, specifically lake sedimentary units upstream of Hell's Canyon. These are dated generally between about 10 million years and 2.5 million years in age. So they're thoroughly within the Miocene and Pliocene time periods. And this is indicative that there was a really large lake system that filled much of the Western Snake River Plain during this time. So if the Snake River currently connects to the Columbia River system through Hell's Canyon, but these prior data sets suggest that perhaps it flowed not through Hell's Canyon in the past, then um, we, one of the major questions that we have to answer is, well, if it didn't go through Hell's Canyon, then how did the Snake River flow? Did it get to the Columbia Basin? Did it have some alternative route? And when exactly did this major canyon in the United States finally in size? Um, so here I have a picture also of what Hell's Canyon looks like. It's a super steep canyon system. And um, the topographic profile on the bottom here is just showing it in comparison to, um, to the Grand Canyon. <clears throat> there are some previous routes that have been previously hypothesized. Um, one of the early ones initially suggested by Livingston in 1928 was that the Hell's Canyon was, again, not the conduit for the Snake River, but that the Snake River instead went through the Baker Valley along this pink highlighted route over here and basically circumnavigated the Wallowa Mountains, which is this topographic bullseye here. And some of the data sets that are suggestive of this are some of the volcanic units in the area. And on the bottom here, what I'm showing is a topographic profile with elevation on the y-axis and distance on the x-axis. The modern Snake River I've plotted here um, from its headwaters in Wyoming to its outlet at the, at the Pacific Ocean here. This pink um, hypothesized uh, path for the Snake River, I've added to this topographic profile over here. Um, so this path does make a bit of sense. It is an, a way for the Snake River to get around uh, its current path through the Hell's Canyon. And the, the passes nearby are just a little bit higher than the maximum estimated uh, elevation at which Lake Idaho filled the Western Snake River Plain. So that's one possible direction. There's another major hypothesis out there suggesting that the Snake River flowed actually towards the Sacramento River system. And uh, so on this map, I've highlighted the location of where this hypothesis suggests that the Snake River went basically out the Owyhee River drainage system through the Black Rock Desert 
and over the Sierra Mountains. A lot of the data sets that have been used to um, identify this as a possible path come from the fossil data sets. Basically in the Sacramento River drainage network, there are some fish fossils that look really quite similar to the, uh, or they're fish that are you know, alive, not fossils yet, um, but they're really similar to fossil data sets from the Lake Idaho. So to get from point A to point B, um, paleontologists basically suggested this alternative path. When we look at the topographic profile, however, um, there is quite a bit of topography in the way for the snake river to come across this route. And so one possibility, if this route is in fact, in fact correct, is that there's been a lot of topographic uplift of this intervening region since the Pliocene, or that the maximum lake level of Idaho is much, much bigger. Um, so we're gonna look at these uh, hypotheses uh, through a, a lens of not just looking at the fossil data sets, but all the also the detrital zircon data sets that we've compiled and created in this, um, in this research project. But first I wanna give a little background on not just you know, where, snake, where the Snake River may have gone, but what sort of mechanisms folks have considered to change its course over time. Rivers can respond to a lot of different topographic drivers in similar ways. If we look locally, um, such as in the um, Western Snake River Plain where you have a big lake basin, there's a couple different topographic drivers that could locally create um, a lake system over time. One idea is that uh, faulting and tectonic uplift, if fast, if fast enough, could have blocked the river system and changed its course. And that's shown in this um, top little block diagram cartoon here. Another suggestion, and this is actually one of the earliest suggestions, is that volcanic flows could have blocked um, the Hell's Canyon or some other river corridor along the Snake River and that the river had to adjust and divert itself um, to overcome this volcanic blockage. Um, the Miocene and Pliocene time periods are very volcanically active um, in the Pacific Northwest and Northern Rocky Mountains. So this is also one possible mechanism. And then finally, thermal plumes could also create a lot of dynamic topography basically via buoyant uplift um, and, and thermal expansion of the crust. And we do have a major driver of potential dynamic topography in the region. If I go back to the map that I was just showing you, the Yellowstone hotspot is a system that's been making a track through North America for the past several um, dozens of millions of years. Specifically in Miocene and Pliocene time, the um, volcanic centers for the Yellowstone hotspot are located here at the Peekaboo Volcanic Center, about six and a half to 10 million years ago. Here in the Heisey Volcanic Center, about 6.6 .6 to 4.5 million years ago. And then finally, after two and a half or two, 2.1 million years, it was located pretty close to where it is today. So this is a major potential driver for, where the, for rearranging river networks as well. Um, but to try and tease apart the differences and what we can see in the geologic area, what we've done in this work is to look at diverse data sets, not just one type, and also integrate over fairly large spatial scales to try and tease out the differences. The main methods we'll be, I'm looking at are using sedimentology to understand depositional ages, uh, depositional environments, and how they change over time. Uh, for this, we like to have accurate depositional ages. So on this figure on the left, I have this nice river cobble on top of a fairly quiet stratigraphic unit, all of this underlain by a thick, beautiful, pure glassy tephra. This would be an ideal situation for me to find in the field. I don't always find it to look quite so nice, but something like this is is always nice to finally see. And those depositional environments and accurate depositional ages allow us to correlate what's happening in different basin systems over time. The main thing I'm gonna be talking about and the main addition that we've had to this um, research topic is using detrital zircon provenance analysis. So in this figure, I'm showing um, some little zircon crystals using cathodoluminescence imaging. And we use these zircon crystals from the sands that we collected to find out where rivers originated and we'll be comparing both modern river zircon age distributions with those that we've collected from sandstones from the Miocene and Pliocene river and lake systems. And finally, we have paleontology. A lot of the previous work that has been done on the Snake River system has been focused on fish fossil and other aquatic biota data sets um, to, idea, to identify common fossil assemblages, which would suggest that lake basins are connected or divergent fossil uh, assemblages, which would suggest that there was a period of time of isolation and evolution. So since a lot of the previous work has been focused on 
um, those fossil data sets. I'm going to st be starting with those for a little bit of background. So a lot of these have been collected from fish fossil data sets, or the fossil data sets that have been used are fish fossils, mollusks, and rodent species. And these are types of creatures that are tightly connected to the aquatic environments they live nearby and can be indicative of drainage pattern reorganizations. Um, some of the fossils are really big, like this one that I saw near the McKay beds in Eastern Oregon. Not entirely sure what this is. It's not a specialist in paleontology, but a lot of the other material is really, really teeny tiny, like this, um, I have a little blow up image here of this tiny fossil um, of a, a fish, part of a fish that's been um, also collected uh, in the Pacific Northwest in the Granger clay pits. So in this previous work, um, has been collected sort of all over the place. We've got a lot of data sets um, indicated by these little pink fish from the Snake River Plain, and also quite a few from um, another lake system called Lake Ringgold um, in central Washington that existed at about the same time. And there's a bunch of scattered different data sets all, um, around Eastern Oregon and in California, and also higher up in the Snake River drainage system. Many of these data sets have been used to suggest that Lake Idaho was isolated from Columbia Basin, basically that the Hell's Canyon was not a conduit um, between these two river systems until about 3 million years ago. So the information that has been used to identify that as a timing for connection between these different basins come from a couple different geologic units. Um, the ones in the Snake River Plain system, they actually come from two different um, geologic formations. One is called the Chalk Hills Formation, and the other is called the Glens Ferry. Both of these are remnants of, of uh, Lake Idaho. Um, the Chalk Hills Formation is dated about 10 million years to about 6.4 million years. And there are several landlocked salmon species found here. Salmon, typically as we think of them today, are an anadromous fish. And they spend part of their life cycle in the ocean and part of it on land. So typically finding something like a salmon would be suggestive that a drainage basin is connected to the ocean. But what these landlocked species suggest is that there is a period of isolation where the salmonids in those in the Snake River Plain were um, basically evolving to their new landlocked environment. Uh, these species also are suggestive of a very deep and oxygenated lake, and again, a closed lake system based on the fact that they're landlocked species. Overlying the Chalk Hills Formation is an uh, unconformity of a couple million years. There's really not a whole lot of strata deposited under over this period of time which has been used to suggest that Lake Idaho perhaps drained or evaporated or became very small and isolated within uh, the Western Snake River Plain at that time period. And about 4.3 million years ago, we have the Glens Ferry Formation. It came back and over the first million years or million and a half years of its history, it filled up the Western Snake River Plain. It got to its, its biggest extent and filled this region uh, encompassed by the dotted blue line. Um, its later history from about 3.3 to about 2.5 million years ago includes a lot of cut and fill terraces and this big prograding deltaic sand called the Pierce Gulch sand uh, that's suggestive of gradual lowering of the lake system. Over that time period as well, in the upper stratigraphy, there is an anadromous salmonid species um, that was identified, which suggests that its connection to the Pacific Ocean was regained. So basically, Lake Idaho came back, it got bigger. And then it started to drain, and there was a connection with the Pacific Ocean that's identified by that salmon species. So that's a lot of the background <clears throat> for the um, what's happening in the Snake River Plain over this time period. But there's a couple other fossil data sets that are also important for this story. The Baker Valley fossil data sets, which comes from here, and I'll just remind you that's along that Livingston hypothesis that the Snake River went around the Wallawas. Um, there's some fish fossils identified in this area that are about 4.5 million years to about 3 million years in age. And these species look really quite different than the Western Snake River Plain fish fossils of that time period, suggesting they're isolated, they're divergent, and there was perhaps several million years of isolation of the Baker Valley. So that's not very good supporting information or supporting data set for that, um, uh, the suggestion that the Snake River went around the Wallawas. The other data sets come from the Columbia Basin, and these are some of the more important ones for identifying that, um, that connection between the Western Snake River Plain and the Columbia Basin. There's a formation called the Ringgold Formation um, within central Washington that has, we've dated between about nine and a half million years to three million years. And it's fairly, fairly continuous sedimentation over that time period. 
um, some of the earlier fossil data sets from the earlier history, about seven to maybe five million years in age, come from the white bluffs and bluff top fossil localities. Those are the ones specifically in the south here near, near the white bluffs in Washington. Um, just, and it's, it's a beautiful white bluff. Um, is, it's just this really beautiful exposure along the modern Columbia River. What these fish fossils show is that the fossils at this time period of the Ringgold Formation don't look similar to the Western Snake River Plain. So there was isolation between these two basin systems earlier on, and they're also warm fish species. So it doesn't seem like there were cold salmonid uh, living creatures at that time. But later on, about three to 2.8 million years in age, there's the deposition of this Taunton fossil locality. And the creatures found in there, which are a lot of fish and rodent fossils, are nearly identical to the ones identified in the Snake River Plain, suggesting that at that time period, there was a connection. And these are also cold water species. So this is a lot of the prior data sets to suggest that the Hell's Canyon was incised sometime around 3 million years ago, perhaps. <clears throat> but to add a little bit more to the story and perhaps a little bit nuance, more nuance, um, what we did was uh, to collect a whole bunch of zircon data sets from sandstones across the region to provide some provenance analysis. So provenance is basically trying to figure out where material came from after, uh, before it was deposited. Zircon minerals are our main mode of provenance analysis here. Uh, they are minerals that are found in almost all river sands. They're really, really abundant in many places. And they're very durable minerals, so they stick around in the geologic environments for a long, long time. Um, the age populations within a particular sandstone provide a unique fingerprint of river systems and basically tell us where they come from. So if you can imagine a couple different um, drainages coming off a mountain system, if we look in one catchment where I, I have highlighted yellow and in the blue catchment, the geology is going to be at least a little bit different in these catchment systems. So if we were to collect samples from rivers or sands, that were uh, derived from these different catchments, the detrital zircons are gonna be looking a little bit different. Perhaps there's something like a pluton of a particular age that's in the blue catchment that doesn't exist in the yellow catchment. And that's gonna be um, what's distinctive about that particular area and that particular river. So what we've done, this is sort of the data set that we've amassed over the past several years. Um, a lot of our data actually comes from modern river systems. And those are quite important because we know the contributing upstream geology to the sand deposit in a, in a river that's active. So if we collect a sample in the Snake River here, we know that everything upstream is game for being eroded and deposited into that area. So on this map, all of the modern river systems that we've collected from are in yellow triangles. The big ones come from big rivers and the little, uh, or not triangles, diamonds. And the little diamonds are little tributaries. So there's quite a few in here. Um, and so we're collecting from the Snake River, the Salmon River up here, the Clearwater, the Columbia, oh wait, this is Spokane, the Columbia's up here, um, the Okanagan, the Methow, and the Yakima River systems. And so those are the modern ones. But we've also, of course, collected a whole bunch of ancestral river sands that come from Miocene and Pliocene age units. And the important thing about these is that we don't necessarily know the contributing upstream terrain and geology to those. So what we've done in our analysis is that we've compared the old river sands to the new river sands to figure out where, they, where that material is coming from. So once we've collected all of our sands, we sift out the zircons using fairly standard separation. Zircon is a really heavy mineral, so there are a bunch of different heavy liquid techniques to extract them specifically. And then using a laser ablation inductively coupled mass spectrometry, we date about 120 zircons per sample or more. Um, and that number kind of depends on how many zircons are actually available for us for different samples. So the result of this analysis is something called the detrital zircon age spectrum. I'm showing an example of it. Um, this is one from the Snake River over here, where there's geologic age on the bottom. So this is the zircon ages that are analyzed using LAICPMS techniques, um, going from zero to 3.5 billion years. And then the y-axis is basically relative abundance. So Zircons that are 50 million years old, there's a high peak here, meaning there's more of them. Where there's a lower peak at maybe 107 million years, that means there are zircons identified of that age, but just not as many of them. And so one of the first things we can do, since this is a modern river system, is look at where it comes from and compare it to the geology that we know in that region. Again, the Snake River is really big, so we've got a lot of terrain to cover. 
Um, so on this diagram on the bottom, what I've done is I've highlighted specific age groups that we see in the Snake River and other river systems and tied to them to the geology that we know about that, that goes into that area. So, and I've kind of color coded everything in a fairly consistent way here. So anything coming from the upper Snake River drainage basins are in pink and purple tones. So a lot of the material in the upper Snake River, so basically from the East Snake River Plain towards its headwaters, um, they tend to be really, these are con groups tend to be really, really old. Um, we have material coming from the Wyoming Craton and the Belt Supergroup. Um, and there's a whole bunch of Mesozoic strata in the Idaho and Wyoming Thrust Belts that recycle really, really old zircons like Yavapai Mazatzel, which is sort of this pink group over here, and uh, Grinville Ages over here. So these are really, really old zircons that are indicative of the upper portions of the Snake River drainage system. Um, some other age groups that we can find in these data sets come from um, central Idaho, and I've color coded those fairly consistently throughout this project or this presentation in sort of yellow and red tones. Some of those come from the Chalice Volcanics, Absorca Volcanics, the Atlanta lobe of the Idaho Batholith. So that's basically material generally from the area north of the Snake River Plains of so central Idaho, and a lot of these ages tend to be Mesozoic in age. Um, there is one indicative age group that is old. It comes from there. It's something called the Lemhi Doublet. And there's two age peaks associated with it. One at about 1380, which comes from a specific pluton that's really um, very fertile with zircons. There's a lot of zircons coming out of it. And then there's another age range, and they, they happen in a pair. They always kind of appear together. And that's one that's indicative of central Idaho. And then finally, we have age sources from the Cascades. So I've sort of colored those in bluer tones. What turns out to be a little bit tough in this analysis and just looking at these uh, zircon age groups is that a lot of the cascade age groups overlap with the ones from central Idaho. So teasing them out by eye turns out to be not a very good idea necessarily. So instead of just looking at, um, even though we, we start with just looking at, you know, sort of what age groups might be in our detrital zircon age spectra, we also use quite a few different statistical techniques to sort of compare and contrast who might be uh, flowing into what direction. Um, and so I just wanted to show, give a sort of a brief time primer on what kind of statistical metrics um, we are using to identify similarity between different samples and different drainage basins. <clears throat> so again, this is a quantitative comparison of detrital zircon age spectra uh, to identify similar deposits of potential sources. So if you can imagine that we have three different samples, we can say these are three different rivers perhaps, um, identified by sample A, B, and C. These are just little cartoon spectra. And we're trying to figure out sort of which one is an important contributor to a reference sample. One could say perhaps this is a sandstone from the Chalk Hills Formation or something like that. Um, some of the metrics that we're looking at look uh, are basically asking the question, do these age peaks line up? So the scale on these metrics is generally from zero to one. One is a good score, zero is a bad score. So if we look at these samples, A, B, and C, the only two that really do a good job of matching our reference sample are samples B and C, because the age peaks are in the same place. But the relative abundance is also important. So there's another metric called similarity that is used to identify that. So even though sample B and C did a really good job, a really good score um, in, in where the zircon ages overlap, the relative age peaks for sample B aren't very similar to the reference sample, whereas sample C they are. So this is just sort of a graph graphical representation of what some of these metrics are measuring. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to show you a whole bunch of numbers associated with the metrics. I thought it would be a lot better just to show you what the detrital zircon spectra are and explain sort of like what we've seen uh, based on the metrics. But one of the important factors um, in this provenance analysis is that um, our detrital zircon uh, spectra from the modern rivers all look a little bit different. And so this is, um, these are diagrams showing the zircon spectra from the Snake River, the Methow and the Okanagan, which flow out of the Cascades, the Spokane, which is not surprisingly uh, near Spokane, Washington, um, the Yakima River, which is another Cascadian River, the Columbia River, which is our big system, um, and the salmon and the Clearwater Rivers are flowing out of the central Idaho area and they connect to the Snake River just downstream of Hills Canyon. But so again, the important thing about these rivers is that when we look at the spectra, they all look a little bit different. 
Some of the diagnostic age groups we found based on our statistical comparisons come from a lot of these old ages. Again, they tend to be the most diagnostic. Um, these Archean ages in purple, they really only show up in the Snake River. In very small abundance do they show up in the Spokane River. So that's a diagnostic age peak. Um, the Yavapai and Mazatzal ages, again, they really show up the most in the Snake River in, in large abundance. Uh, the Lemhi doublet, which I mentioned is from central Idaho, we see those showing up really well in the salmon and the clear water drainages, which makes sense because the, those sources are right along that river. And then what we don't see in the Columbia River or in the Yakima or the Okanagan or the Methow is a bunch of old age groups. They're all fairly young. And so that's going to be important for, for when we look at our old rivers um, and our old sandstones uh, at differentiating where these zircons might come from. So in this slide, what I'm showing is a select number of our sandstones that we have DZ spectra for. So on the top, I have the Ringgold formation. I've got four samples. I'm just showing a couple here. I've got a couple from Lake Idaho. We've got the Glens Ferry formation as well as the Chalk Hills. Uh, the Troutdale formation, this is collected along the Columbia River Gorge. And the Manita Pass and Six Mile Creek gravels, these are actually collected in southwestern Montana near the Continental Divide. Um, and I'll show you on the map what um, where they are exactly. But we collected them because there is another hypothesis out there that I didn't mention early on, that, um, that some portions of the eastern Snake River Plain actually flowed to the north. Um, into southwestern Montana in the Miocene. So we collected those to see if they were also potentially um, useful for this analysis. Turns out that they are. And then the Clarkson Heights gravel, this is one collected, um, it's on the Snake River, it's basically right next to the Snake River today. Um, but it's, um, what's kind of surprising is that it turns out that there's not a lot of those old indicative zircons of the upper Snake River drainage, which kind of indicated to us that perhaps this material was deposited before Hell's Canyon was actually in size. So that was actually pretty cool to see. Um, what we can identify from these paleo data sets initially, and that the statistics also agree with, is that there's a whole bunch of material in the Ringgold Formation derived from the upper Snake River drainages. We can't explain these detrital zircon age groups without having the Snake River in some way involved in deposition into the central um, uh, Columbia, or yeah, the Columbia Basin. What's another thing, cool thing that we can notice um, and that's borne out in the statistics is that the Chalk Hills Formation, which is that older version of Lake Idaho, doesn't have a lot of upper Snake River um, sources. They're all very locally sourced zircons, which means there wasn't a big river coming into Lake Idaho at that time. But the Glens Ferry Formation, which again is that younger version of Lake Idaho, does have some of those age groups, suggesting that there was a change in the source area um, over the history of Lake Idaho. And so just to show where some of these samples are collected, again, our Ringgold samples are collected in central Washington. And it turns out statistically, they're very quite similar to um, the detrital zircon spectra collected from the Six Mile Creek Formation over here. So these appear very similar statistically. And when we look at the DZ strata spectra and where those zircons we think came from, that also makes a lot of sense. They've got those older zircon age groups together. The Clarkston Heights gravel, which is located in this red circle here, again, it's downstream of the Hell's Canyon, but along the modern Snake River system, it doesn't have these old ages. It has a lot of material that looks like it comes from central Idaho, but not from the upper portion of the Snake River system. And again, it looks like Lake Idaho changes, its source terrain changes from being very locally sourced to including a larger drainage area after about 4.3 million years ago. So to link a lot of these data sets together with our fossil data sets, it doesn't seem like any of these data sets agree with either of the hypotheses of where the Snake River went over time. The Baker Valley hypothesis um, is not borne out well by some of the fossil data sets. And we actually do have a detrital zircon age uh, spectra for this sample over here that also doesn't seem like there's any Snake River type or even central um, Idaho type zircons in it. So that, that hypothesis doesn't seem like it's borne out well. And then importantly, the Ringgold Formation, it's got to have some contribution from the Snake River over its de depositional history. So the Sacramento drainage doesn't also make any sense based on the detrital zircon data sets. So what if it went in a different direction? We tried to come up with a way to link all of our data sets together 
and make sense with not just the digital zircon data sets, but also the fossil data sets. And since a lot of the fossil data sets suggest that Lake Idaho is actually isolated um, during at least the Clark Hills formation time period, um, we suggest that the Hills or that the Snake River may have actually flowed northwards around the Rocky Mountains. And this allows for those zircons from the upper Snake River drainage system to get into the Columbia Basin while circumnavigating um, the, uh, the uh, Western Snake River Plain. So this is a hypothesis, it's new, it's a little bit unusual. Um, it's hard to conceive that a river can change so rapidly from this northerly route to a southerly route. And so we decided uh, to find a way to test this hypothesis, again, using the detrital zircon data sets. <clears throat> so there's a relatively new application of detrital zircon um, analysis called unmixing. The idea here being that if you collect a sample that's downstream of a couple different drainages and you have zircon age groups that you know come from those upper drainages, um, we can basically now estimate the relative proportion of those sources to this green sample here. So if the Snake River is an important contributing factor, can we quantitatively say how much of it is involved in, um, in deposition in the Columbia Basin? Is it necessary at all? Or, and if so, how much? So we can test these different hypotheses using this DZ unmixing technique. And we have three different model setups to test each of these three hypotheses. The first hypothesis that we're testing, I call it the all snake model. This is to test the Baker Valley hypothesis. So if the Baker Valley hypothesis is correct, which kind of don't think it is, but we're gonna test it anyways, then the Snake River needs to be involved in deposition into the Columbia River Basin. And not just some of the Snake River, all of it. The other hypothesis that we tested is the Sacramento route. If the Snake River didn't flow into the Columbia Basin at all, and it went to Sacramento, then it shouldn't be involved in the detrital zircon H sources at all. So this is another model that we're testing. Um, so we just basically delete the Snake River um, from the model setup. And then the last one we're testing is what I'm calling the East Snake model. Um, so we're testing whether or not the new hypothesis is accurate in any way by using just some of the tributaries that are in the upstream regions of the Snake River system. <clears throat> so how this sort of looks um, in this unmixing technique, we, we look at um, the measured detrital zircon A spectrum from a sandstone. This is one from the Ringgold shown in white. We can look at the data in a couple of different ways. One is a kernel density estimate. That's more or less what I've been showing you in the detrital zircon age spectrum before, where we have age on one axis and relative probability on the other. Another way to look at it is a cumulative density function or CDF. I find these a little bit easier to look at. Um, and it's sort of a stair-step pattern where you have, again, age on the x-axis and cumulative probability on the y-axis. So if there's a lot of zircons of a particular age group, you get a steep portion of the graph. And if there's relatively few zircons of a particular age range, then you get a shallow part of the graph. So when we look at the, uh, this example of one of the wrinkled formation samples and compare it to the individual rivers, which I just have in these colorful CDFs, you can see that not one single river really replicates this data very well. So in the DZ mixing technique, what we use is we use all the upper, um, the modern rivers as potential sources. And we create about 100,000 synthetic mixtures of these potential sources and try and best replicate um, our, our actual sample detrital zircon spectra from the sandstone. And so we do this 100,000 times um, for every sample and for every model. It ends up being a lot of models. Um, and then we pick sort of our best fit model spectrum. And then we look at how much each of these rivers is modeled to contribute to best replicate the measured spectrum. So that's shown by that red line right here. And we do this for, again, all of our models, um, all of our three different setups and all of our different samples. Again, I'm showing an example of um, the Ringgold formation in white and the good fit models in gray and the best fit model in red. And this is just an example of the all snake model, the east snake model, and the no snake model. So the no-snake model, it turns out, doesn't do a very good job of replicating our samples from the Columbia Basin um, at all. And it doesn't do a good job of replicating anything from the Six Mile Creek Formation either. So it doesn't seem like the idea that the Snake River went to Sacramento 
makes a lot of sense for our detrital zircon data sets. When we look at the all snake model and the east snake model, they all look actually pretty good. Um, these mixtures do a much better job of replicating the measured spectra than any individual river. When we look at the details and all of our samples together, the east snake model just does a little bit better statistically. So that sort of gives us, um, you know, some supporting information that this new hypothesis might have something to it. <clears throat> um, so one of the other things we can look at is not just what the results look like in general, but geographically, where these best fit models, um, what these best fit models are showing. So I wanted to first show, focus on some of the wrinkled formation on mixing model results. On the far right, I have graphs showing the cumulative density functions with the, um, the best fit model is in red and the measured spectra is in black. So you can see that all of these for our four different wrinkled samples are doing a pretty okay job at replicating the measured spectrum. Um, and then the pie charts on the bottom are showing our best fit model with a goodness of fit value um, uh, shown by GOF there. Um, and the pie charts are basically showing the relative contribution of particular drainages as our source models into that are required to be mixed together and create the best fit model. So this top one over here, if you see a lot of purple and pink, that's correlated to these um, drainages in the Eastern Snake River Plain. Um, and, and if there's a lot of yellow material, that say, suggests that there's a lot of material coming from the Columbia River, so on and so forth. So I tried to color code these so that they're visually useful. Um, what we see is that the samples collected in the northern part of the Columbia Basin, circled over here, show a lot of East Snake River, River Plain derived zircons fairly consistently. You need a lot of the zircons from these upper drainages um, to make those samples make sense. When we look to the south, um, this sample over here, located near the White Bluffs in the southern part of the Columbia Basin, um, that one's this one over here. The Snake River Plain, it's involved somehow, we think, in recreating those detrital zircon H spectra. So you see some pink samples here. But there's a lot of red and orange, which correlates to the Salmon River and the Clearwater River um, on this map here. What's kind of cool about that is that we think this helps us pinpoint a river confluence in, in the past, in Miocene, um, in which the Salmon and, and the Clearwater Rivers were meeting with the you know, circuitous route of the Snake River somewhere south of these northern samples, but north of the southern sample because we're just really not seeing that clear water and salmon river being a major contributing factor in these, these, upper, um, these upper samples. When we look at some of the detailed results from the Six Mile Creek formation and from, um, which is uh, this sample here or these samples, and then uh, this is the Monida Pass gravel. Again, we're seeing a lot of material derived from the East Snake River Plain, a lot of pink and purple in here. Um, and then when we look at uh, suggesting that you know they're a major contributing factor in, in that depositional system. And then we're also seeing a lot of um, salmon and clear water uh, contribution to this Clarkston Heights gravel. Again, that's on the modern Snake River, but we're not seeing a lot of those upper Snake River derived zircons. So that kind of confirms what we were thinking before, that those old age groups are just not in that data set. <clears throat> so I've tried to put this together in a bit of a um, sort of a schematic map of what we think has been going on over time in a couple different time slices and um, kind of listed the data sets that are supportive of, um, of these different time periods. So between about 10 and a half and 6.5 million years ago, the Lake Idaho data sets come from the Chalk Hills Formation. It seems like it was isolated from the Columbia Basin based on the fish fossil data sets. The Zircon data set suggests that the Upper Snake River drainage was not really contributing into this area. So we think that there was a drainage divide somewhere around here between the East and Western Snake River Plain. The Columbia Basin, however, uh, does seem that there is a lot of contributing zircons from the Upper Snake River drainage. So we think that the Snake River must have sort of gone around the Northern Rocky Mountains and into the Columbia Basin from the Northeast. At the same time period, we have the Yellowstone hotspot located at the Peak Boo Volcanic Center between, I mean, the time periods really overlap quite well between about 10.4 to 6.6 .6 million years in age. Um, and so it's 
It makes sense, therefore, that the Yellowstone hotspot created a lot of dynamic topography in this region and was the reason why the East Snake River Plain and the Western Snake River Plain were not connected up during the Chalk Hills phase of Lake Idaho. Between about 6.5 and 5 million years ago, um, the stratigraphic data from Lake Idaho uh, are absent, basically suggesting that the lake drained or evaporated or got very small. Um, and then the fish fossil data sets from Lake Idaho or Lake Ringgold rather, um, continue to suggest that the fish fossils, they're different. And so there, there's still isolation between the Snake River Plain and the Columbia Basin. So there's still no Hell's Canyon at that time. Um, the zircon data sets continue to say that the Columbia Basin is receiving zircons from the upper detrital or from the upper um, Snake River Basin. So even though the high Z volcanic center is sort of impinging on the east side of the East Snake River Plain at this time, we think that the river still found a way um, to get into the Columbia Basin um, in the later Miocene. Going into uh, this time period between five and 3.3 million years, Lake Idaho returns, it gets really big, and the detrital zircon data sets suggest that there's more distal zircons being filtered into this region. The Yellowstone hotspot at this time period has a lull in volcanic activity and it continues to move east. So we think that the buoyant forces from this hotspot are sort of moving out of the Snake River Plain, allowing for um, a lot of the dense material that's been built up in the crust in the East Snake River Plain to allow for a subsidence. And this we think is a lot of it why the Snake River, River finally reached the West Snake River Plain, is that the Yellowstone hotspot moves out of the system. There's a lot of dense material in the East Snake River Plain and that causes subsidence and that basin to finally form. There's additional information on um, the timing of subsidence and the amount from some previous work. Um, after about 4.2 million years ago, the East Snake River Plain subsided relative to the Tendoy Range, which is this um, basically where the Monida Pass gravels were collected from, by about um, 745 meters. So that's, and it's thought that it, that, that subsidence is created from uh, crust crustal material, it's very dense basaltic material being added to the crust and causing it to sink. Funny enough, the sort of values uh, suggested for the amount of subsidence between the East Snake River Plain and the Tendoy Range, again, it's 745 meters. That's almost exactly the amount of elevation difference between the Snake River, Eastern Snake River Plain Valley floor and the Monida Pass gravels. So, that even though that there's this like large topographic difference between where the East Snake River Plain is now and the Monida Pass, we also have supporting information that suggests that that amount of elevational difference has you know, a cause and a mechanism behind it and that it did in fact happen. And then more recently, uh, the stratigraphic data from Lake Idaho suggest that we have a prograding del take system after about 3.3 million years ago. And so the lake started to drain. Um, the Ringgold Formation fossil data sets are suggesting that finally Lake Idaho and Lake Ringgold are connected. And so this suggests that at this time period, sometime between I'd say 3.0 and 2.5 million years ago, that Hell's Canyon was finally incised. At this time, Yellowstone has moved certainly out of the picture and is pretty close to its modern location. So again, a lot of these previous hypotheses, they had really good ideas, but one of the flaws of both of them is that they both assume that the Snake River actually flowed into the Snake River Plain during the, uh, or into Lake Idaho at this time period. Our detrital zircon data set suggests that it didn't go into the Western Snake River Plain, but actually circumnavigated the Northern Rockies into the Columbia Basin. So this route doesn't only satisfy the provenance data sets that we've based it on, but also satisfies the fossil data sets that were made previously collected and is consistent with the stratigraphic data sets, both in the um, Western Snake River Plain and in the Columbia Basin. So do I have any time left or should I kind of wrap up? Okay, I just have one more slide on thinking about mantle dynamics and topographic evolution. So again, it seems like the Snake River Plain is intricately tied to two competing drivers of topographic evolution. Um, Yellowstone hotspot uplift and localized subsidence in the East Snake River Plain. So if we look at a heat flow map of the West of the United States, the Yellowstone hotspot is located over here. This is the track of it. Yellowstone is currently located at this point where the heat flow map is sort of at its maximum. 
And then the East Nacre Plain is in this area right here. It's still pretty warm. Um, not as warm as where the Yellowstone hotspot currently is, but it's, it's a hot area in, in the crust. But when we look at the gravity data sets below, so high values are pinks and lower values are blue. Um, this data set is showing that a lot of the snake river plain is underlain by a lot of dense material. So again, what we're thinking is that when the Yellowstone hotspot is underneath the East Snake River Plain, the buoyancy forces related to that dynamic topography are able to overcome the subsidence that would have otherwise happened in, in the absence of that heat flow. But it doesn't take much for much cooling down to, um, to cause that subsidence to overcome um, residual heat from the Yellowstone hot spot. So basically the hotspot moves further east and that, um, and that crustal densification can really take hold on what's happening topographically in the East Nicaragua Plain after about three million years ago, maybe four and a half million years ago. So if, I, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them.